Man, now it is 11 o'clock and we thank the Lord for this part of the Sabbath school. We honor God because he has blessed us once again to come together to study his word. And each time the Lord has, um, has met us and we thank God for that. We don't want to take that for granted that he's allowing us to learn of his word. Thank you for joining us, whether you are um, joining us by Zoom or Facebook. We praise God that you are tuning in, and we hope that you will enjoy the Sabbath school. Um, we give honor to our Apostle James and give honor to Lady Jane. Um, and at this time, we're going to turn it into the hands of our teachers um, for this morning, our Deacon Preston and our Apostle James. All right, Deacon Preston. Amen. As always, happy Sabbath. We would just want to personally thank you for taking the time to engage with us today in Sabbath school. You have a choice on what you do every Sabbath day, and we are so glad that you have made the choice to join us. Before I jump into my portion of the presentation, I also just want to say uh, happy Black History Month as we think about uh, Black History Month. And I know that our leading lady did something with her class, and I know the church is going to have a formal program but when we think about the origins of uh, Black History Month, when you have a moment, take a look at Carter G. Woodson. He's actually a native of Virginia. Uh, he was actually uh, the person who really began to do the work around what they used to call Negro History Week. And uh, that was actually the genesis of what we have as Black History Month. And so we just wanted to take a minute to um, just celebrate Black history as we think about this very important month the contributions, the uh, how much African Americans have contributed to not only the United States success, but world success. And we're very grateful for Carter G. Woodson and his contributions to making that happen. So before I jump into it, I always like to give our Apostle Raglan an opportunity to engage and welcome you to Sabbath School. So I'm going to put it in his hands. Apostle? Uh, good morning, Deacon Preston. Uh, good morning to as Sabbath School Superintendent, as Sister Charmaine White, and to the teachers this morning for our younger classes, our, our Sister Darlene Radlin with class number one, and singing away, Sister Darlene, <laughs> thank God for uh, our leading lady uh, who was standing in for uh, uh, Deacon Rodney this morning. He's out of town with his, his family, and we thank God for just the opportunity to be here Quick, I'm um, to say this real quickly for those who were on last night for our uh, conclusion of our study of the core values. I'm telling you, Apostle Clark did a masterful job uh, explaining the oneness of the Creator. It was just wonderful. Um, again, we honor God, we honor Deacon Preston, you, the Sabbath School class, those who are joining us by Facebook Live, those who are joining us on Zoom. It's a beautiful lesson, wonderful lesson. I believe that we will be benefited greatly from this lesson today. So uh, I think it was last week, you know, y'all flooded the, the chat with questions and comments. We encourage you to do the same thing today. I'd rather that we run out of time and be excited about it uh, rather than you all leave it all to dig and press it in myself. Now, we'll do it, but it's just so much more exciting when you all do it with us. So be blessed and back to you, Dick and Preston. Amen. So again, Apostle, I agree with that. And we're going to jump right into our lesson. And I always like to, uh, as we begin our Sabbath school lesson, I always like to just really think about uh, some things I always like to say to anyone who's a part of our Sabbath school. And we always say, welcome to the house of God. We are a Christ-centered, Bible-based church that endeavors to teach the truths of God and have a positive impact on our community by demonstrating the love of Jesus Christ. So this love of Jesus Christ, this love of God is foundational in everything that we attempt to do here at the house of God. And so you will learn about the commandments, you'll learn about our core values, but even beyond that, the foundation of what we really want to model is the love of Jesus Christ. And so when we think about this love, this love of God or this love of Jesus, I always like to define it. God's love is his holy disposition towards all that he has created that compels him to express unconditional affection and selective correction to provide the highest and best quality of existence, both now and forever for the objects of his love. 
And then when we think about God's faithfulness, this is another attribute of God that I always like to study is God's faithfulness means he is steadfast in affection and allegiance. And how do I know God is able to be faithful 100% of the time? I know it because he's all knowing. He's never caught off guard. He's all powerful. He never encounters anything or anyone that can thwart his plan or his purpose. God is a holy, pure, honest, full of integrity. He is not able to lie. He is the eternal God. And this is something that Apostle Clark touched on yesterday. He said, um, God is omnipresent. He's, he's everywhere. And he said, sometimes we may not fully understand that. And so as we get into the lesson today, and I continue to repeat this because I really want to make sure as we study God's word and we dig into his word, that we utilize this three question framework as we study the scripture. And so that three question framework is really, what does it say? So as I read the scripture, what does it say? What am I hearing? And then what does it mean? What's that interpretation that I have? And then most importantly, what does it mean to me as far as how do I apply what God's word is saying to me? And so our lesson today is be strong and very courageous. And what our Sabbath school writer wanted us to get from this lesson today is that we must be strong and courageous doing adversities we encounter in life. Let us stay alert and fasten to the law of God, not turning to the right hand or to the left. And take good heed to yourselves that you love the Lord and cleave to him. And so these are some of the things that the Sabbath school writer wants us to take away from our lesson today. So we're going to make sure that we attempt to do that. So if you've got your Sabbath school books, I want you to go with me to our uh, introduction. We're going to read that. We're going to jump into several scriptures. And I always say, we're not going to get through all of the scriptures today, but our attempt is to get through probably three of them. We'll take a look at really um, Joshua chapter one. We want to take a look at Matthew chapter seven. Then we're going to go over to first John. I'll introduce this today with a scripture in Deuteronomy. And then we're going to dig right into this lesson. As Apostle said, I invite you to engage. I invite you to put questions on. If you're on Facebook, put your questions there. If you are on Zoom, put your questions in the chat. As we dig into this very important lesson, be strong and very courageous. The book of Joshua begins with the Lord commanding Joshua to go with the children of Israel over the Jordan River to possess the land the Lord promised to them. Taking possession of the land was no small task. It would require miraculous interventions from the Lord and great faith from the people. In three out of the nine verses of, the cha of chapter one, the Lord reiterated his encouragement to Joshua to be strong and of good courage and not to be afraid or dismayed. Memory verse, Joshua 1, 7, only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded thee, turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. Biblical application. The strength and courage referred to in Joshua chapter 1 are not physical. Although the people needed to fight to possess the land, the exhortation is referring to maintaining spiritual focus and obedience to the law of God. Strength in the context means to fasten, to siege, and courage is defined as being alert physically and mentally. Joshua had to stay alert and fastened to the law of God, not turning to the right hand or to the left hand. The land was full of distractions and people that worshiped false gods. Today, we are surrounded by a society that bows down to everything except the true and living God. In order to maintain focus, God told Joshua to meditate day and night and not to stop talking about God's law. Before his death, Joshua exhorted the people with the same word God had given him, be strong and courageous, enough not to turn aside from God's law is a result of our love for God. Let us take good heed unto ourselves that we love the Lord and cleave unto him. We must be strong and courageous to enter in at the straight gate. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. So Apostle, before we jump into the heart of this lesson, we'll go to a scripture in Deuteronomy. Anything you want to share as you think about what are the things we've got to make sure we get out of this lesson today? 
you know, they had made that journey through the, um, the wilderness. God had destroyed the opposition, and that being those that were um, 20 and over that when they came out of Egypt. But there was here we have a change in leadership. We find that Moses had, um, was a marvelous, um, a wonderful, miraculous leader. God used mightily, but now Moses, my servant, is gone. That's what he said. And now it's falling on Joshua. Uh, God has set Joshua up to be successful, but there were still oppositions. And on the way that he was going to make it to the promise and, and receive all the promises, if you look in chapter 1, you see what God is saying. You look in chapter 23, you see the reiteration of it because what we find is that God has set Joshua and those followers up to be successful, but it was still up to them if they were going to be successful. Amen. Amen. And I think that's a great segue into our first scripture. So if you would go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 34. And so Deuteronomy chapter 34, Deuteronomy is actually what some would call the second writing of the law as Moses is closing out. This is actually the last book of what people would call the first five books, the Pentateuch. And Moses is actually closing out um, this, this letter. And you will begin to see this transition in leadership. So Deuteronomy chapter 34, beginning at verse 5. And I'm reading this from the athlete's version of the Bible. And it says this. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, just as the Lord had said. The Lord buried him in a valley near Beth Peor in Moab. But to this day, no one knows the exact place. Moses was 120 years old when he died, yet his eyesight was clear and he was as strong as ever. The people of Israel mourned Moses, for Moses on the plains of Moab for 30 days until the customary period of mourning was over. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him, so the people of Israel obeyed him doing just as the Lord had commanded Moses. There has never been another prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. The Lord sent him to perform all the miraculous signs and wonders in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all his servants and his entire land. With mighty power, Moses performed terrifying acts in the sight of all of Israel. So apostle, you said this was the transition. And so what we will do here, what I wanted to paint the picture of, Moses is 120 years old when he passes away, but he is not some weak 120 year old. The scripture says his eyesight was clear. He was as strong as ever, but his time as the leader of the nation of Israel is ended. He actually does something I think is significant. We, he lays his hands on Joshua. This is a transferring of the leadership. It's transferring of the power. It's saying, Joshua, not only has God said you're the one, but I'm also saying as well, you know what? I'm endorsing you as the new leader because I know my time is up. And so now we see this transition from Moses's leadership. Now think about this. The writer of Deuteronomy says, you know, there's not been a leader in Israel's history like Moses. Remember, God spoke to Moses face to face. They had this interaction. Moses leads a hard hearted and stiff necked people. And now that role now goes over to Joshua. And now we'll jump to Joshua chapter one. And this is where we will spend the bulk of our time in Sabbath school because I want to pull a lot out of this. So, Apostle, anything you want to say about Deuteronomy chapter 34 we, before we jump into Joshua chapter one? You know, the only thing I have to say is, all good things come to an end. Mm. And Moses was a good thing. And this is the thing. T to keep this in mind, Abraham was the father of Israel. Mm. Joshua was the one God chose to bring Israel into the promised land. Abraham came to an end. Joshua time came to an end. And as much as they uh, uh, were in opposition to war, I mean, uh, Moses' time came to an end. And much as they were in opposition to Moses, now they're mourning. 
part of their mourning because it was customary. They mourned 30 days. But now uh, they recognize what God, how God had used Moses to get him to this point. Amen. And so uh, here's what I want us to do. Let's go to Joshua chapter one. And as we go through this, what I would have you to do, if you've got your learning notes, um, I put a lot in the learning notes that I just want us to be able to go through, and then we'll go through a series of questions. So I want you to pay particular attention to a lot of the things that happen in Joshua chapter one and one through nine. And I'm reading from the King James Version. It says, now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun. Moses minister saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people unto the land, which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have I not commanded thee, be strong and of good courage, be not afraid, neither be dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. So we're going to spend a lot of time in this one, this one scripture because I really want to pull out a lot of things as we see this transition in leadership. What does, what does God actually speak to Joshua to give him this encouragement to be an effective leader? So I want us just to think about some of the things as we, as we look at our Sabbath school lesson and our notes, and we think about some of the things we want to make sure. Now, let's look at this. As we begin the chapter, uh, it's pointed out in one of the very, the first verse, now after the death of Moses, and then verse two, it says, Moses, my servant is dead. So really what's happening is God is saying, you know what, as good as Moses was and he was good and we had this relationship, his time is over and here is a new beginning with a new leader. And so I wrote this in the message notes and I'm going to ask this question to the Sabbath school. How do you embrace new challenges? Do you embrace challenges in faith or do you embrace challenges in fear? Because as we think about Joshua, as we think about what he had to deal with, there's some things that he is aware of. So now let's go back. Joshua has watched a nation leave Egypt and be in the wilderness and consistently disobey. So Joshua has been there when they, he was, uh, Moses was given the Ten Commandments and they come off the mountain and guess what the children of Israel are doing? They built the golden calf. Joshua is there when the sons of Korah come against Moses and his leadership. Joshua is there when they have manna. But guess what? They, they don't just want manna. They want meat. And they tell God, I want all this stuff. So now Joshua, and this is some of us, as we embrace new challenges, do we look at these things from a perspective of faith? Or do we look at them from a perspective of fear? So I want to just point that out. And then I want us to think about this. 
the edification and encouragement that God actually gives to Joshua. He says three times, he says, be strong and courageous. So I want to ask the Sabbath school class to engage with me here. Why do you think that God actually said this three times to Joshua? I want to ask the, the class that. Why do you think God actually said that to Joshua three times? So I want to put it on Facebook. I want you to put it in the chat. What are your thoughts on, man, God says that to him three times. Any thoughts? And Apostle, I'll actually start with you. Any thoughts on that? Well, this is my thought. And for the very reason that you had just pointed out, Joshua has seen Israel at his worst. Mm. And showing, and Israel seeing, uh, Joshua seeing how Israel could do, how they could behave. Yes, a whole lot of them had dropped in the wilderness, but there was a whole lot of them that was still 60 years, or younger than 60 years old, that had that messy ways with them too. And, and no doubt, as the understudy of Moses, Joshua thought could have been, Lord, I know what you're saying. I know what you want me to do, but I also know this people. Right. And God had to remind Joshua three times to say, look, you just be strong. And the thing that's kind of the understatement here is I gave you something. I've given you principles to live by. I gave you my commandment. I gave you my laws, my statutes, my judgment. If you will apply these things, you have a reason or something to be strong and courageous for. And if you don't apply these principles, you are going, and that's what we're going to find in this lesson as we go forward. You're going to find if you don't keep these principles ever before you, if you don't study them, if you don't get into them, the people are going to do all kinds of stuff and you're not going to have a foundation to address what's going on. Amen. So I love that apostle and, I, and I'm getting some comments in the chat. So Sister Joan says this. If I hear something more than once, I tend to remember it better. Uh, and, I, and, and that's such a great point. And then someone from our Facebook audience says, for reiteration purposes and to instill trust. So here's the thing I would say. I was doing some study this week, and, and I would say Joshua has seen some of the negative aspects of leading this people. Okay? Now, here's the other thing we've got to remember. Joshua has actually already been into the promised land. He knows what it looks like. Yeah. And it's him and Caleb who come back and say, hey, we're well able to possess it. And the other 10 spies say, I don't think we got what it takes. And Joshua has to wait 40 years, but he understands his people. So I read something this week uh, um, from a psychological standpoint. For every time someone says negative something negative to you, it th takes three times of you saying something positive to wipe away that negative thing. So I think it's interesting that God says, be strong, be courageous, be strong, be courageous. And we'll break this down, uh, particularly from the standpoint of how this thing reiterates. Now, we said in prior lessons, when you think about where we win or lose, we lose in our mind. This is where the enemy begins to plant seeds of doubt. This is where the enemy begins to plant seeds of discouragement. Can you imagine what it must have been like? So I'm going to ask all of us to be Joshua for a moment. You're stepping into the, some of the biggest shoes ever. Even though Moses has laid hands on you, even though God is saying this, you look and you see a group of people that you understand are hard-headed, they're stiff-necked, they, they have been a problem the entire time. Even the ones who have died off, you got a whole new generation that's coming in. So I really want to spend some time today as we look at this. I want us to be mindful of what God, how God really encouraged Joshua. So three times he says, be strong and be courageous. As you look at your Bibles and go back to Joshua chapter one, and I want to point out how many times God says to Joshua, I, not Joshua, but I. And I want to point this out. So go look at your Bibles. And I, I just printed this off. And if you've got the message notes, you'll notice I really tried to highlight this eyepiece. Now, I just want to go over this. As we look at it, he says, I do give it to you. I've given it unto you. I said it to Moses. I was with Moses. I will be with thee. I will not fail thee. I swear unto you, have I not commanded thee? 
So I want you to think about how many times God is pointing to Joshua. Joshua, this isn't really about you. This is about you relying on me and my power and actually being obedient to my word. So just wanted to throw that out there. I'm looking at something here from our Facebook audience. Considering how great Moses had been, Joshua may have felt intimidated or inferior and felt like he couldn't live up to the expectations. God wanted him to know that he was with him and that he would ensure his leadership success. So that's a great tie into my next point. And I want to just bring this point out. And, and if you're making notes, make this note. And this is around the power of mindset. And I want you to really think about it. And so I would ask you, what is your mindset? Because this is why I do believe God was preparing Joshua to have the right mindset as he came into the land. So I'm going to bring some secular uh, knowledge into the Sabbath school class today because I really think it's important that we understand what's my mindset as I approach things. And I'm going to walk through some things today. And um, hopefully you enjoyed this portion because I just wanted to make sure as we get educated, as we get uplifted in God's word, that we think about what's my mindset. So I'm going to read some things to you. So there is a book from a Stanford psychologist called Carol Dweck called The Power of Mindset. And she defines mindset as this. A mindset is a self-perception or a self-theory that people hold about themselves. So really your mindset is, how do I see myself? And I always say this, and people may not agree, the person who talks to you the most is you. It's your mindset. And so if Joshua felt intimidated, and someone mentioned that on our Facebook, if he felt inferior, what was he saying to himself? And so it's really important as we think about the power of mindset. And so Carol Dweck, and I would encourage you, um, if you get an opportunity to go out on YouTube, she's got some really good videos. She talks about mindset. And this is for our entire Sabbath school lesson, but especially for our young people. And I'm encouraging you to think about your mindset. Your mindset will determine a lot about the success or lack of success you may have in your life. And so I wanted to bring this point up today. And Apostle, I'd appreciate us having some conversation around this. So I think about the power of mindset, and it's that self-perception or that theory that you hold about yourself. And now I just wanted to share some things about um, fixed mindset and a growth mindset, and I want to tie into Joshua chapter one. So a person who has a fixed mindset, and this is what uh, Carol Dweck says, there are really two mindsets. It's a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. And she does a lot of studying and she does this, um, she does this experiment in Chicago with, I believe, some eighth graders. And she gives them a very challenging puzzle. And she notices it's the children who have a growth mindset that embrace the challenge. They're not discouraged by the challenge. They are asking themselves questions that they are really looking at, okay, how can I embrace it? And then she notices a second group of children that have a fixed mindset. And if they don't fail, what they actually do is they actually step away from challenges. And so she has this saying, I'm not good at it yet. So I want to just share some of these things as we tie this mindset piece in to Joshua and then how we think about this Sabbath school lesson. So if you have a fixed mindset, you typically avoid challenges. You avoid obstacles. You give up easy. Um, you see your efforts as fruitless. Or even worse, you just don't think you can accomplish things. Um, you ignore useful or useful negative criticism or feedback. You don't want to receive that. And when you think about the success of others, you feel threatened by the success of others. But when you have a growth mindset, you embrace challenges. You persist in the face of adversity. You see effort as a way that you can master skill and you actively seek feedback from other people. And when you see other people succeed, you find lessons in their success. And so, Apostle, I wanted to bring this in today because I really was thinking about what was Joshua's mindset. And I'd like for your thoughts on this thing around growth mindset 
And after Sabbath school, I'll send something to St. Brenda that she can share with the Sabbath school on mindset. This is a really important topic that I want us in the church to really focus on. What is my mindset? Apostle, any thoughts? You know, I'm, as I look at the the chart you just put up, a come of mindset. Uh, Joshua had, a, even though Joshua, now Joshua had been encouraged by the Lord, but his encouragement, I believe, led him to the mindset that he eventually ended up with. And he had a growth mindset. When you read in Joshua um, chapter 24, I don't want to get too far ahead of you, but in Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15, and I'm going to uh, just quote the latter part of that verse, what he said, but as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. That defines Joshua's mindset. You know, I, my mindset, I, I, I'm going to grow in Christ. My mindset is to get to where I need to be. Y'all can mess up. Y'all can in, in, interact with these heathen nations and do all this stuff that you have been told not to do. But I know that if I stay the course, if I know that I continue, I'm going to grow. So his mindset was to grow in, in, in God. Amen. And Apostle, I love that. So we've got a, a great point in on our from our Facebook audience. Could there also be a broken mindset? And I, I love that point. So whoever wrote that out on our Facebook audience, I want you to give me more. What, did, what would you what would a broken mindset look like? Because this is a really important topic, because as we think about this, this lesson is about be strong and courageous. And as we go into the next phase of this lesson, what we're really trying to get through is what is my mindset? Do I have a positive growth mindset? But then also, how do I deal with distractions? Because this is really the tie into the lesson. Remember, when we first started, being strong and being courageous is not about physical strength. What, what God was really equipping Joshua was you got to have the right mind because you're going to fight some battles. I've given it to you. It's yours. But here are going to be some of the distractions you run into. So when I think about the question, could there also be something of a broken mindset? And if I misinterpret it, I'll ask our Facebook participant to clean me up. Uh, they can, Preston, let me kind of chime in. Yeah, go ahead. Even and, and I, like, like you were saying, I'm not sure what the pay, Facebook participant is really getting to. But I will say this. Uh -huh. A broken mindset could lead to a fixed mindset. Okay, tell me why. Because, because the thing is, if I'm broken, if I don't see a way out, if I don't see progress, if I don't see anything happening positive in my life, I can find myself, I'm just going to stay the course. I'm going to stay in the safety zone. I'm not going to step out of these boundaries. And that brokenness has led me to have a fixed mind. And my mindset become, let me just survive. Let me just get, let me just get through the day. You know, all of us have had those days when life was so challenging. All we felt like if I could just get through this day, or if I could just get through the night, or whatever's going on, I believe that tomorrow is going to be okay. But right now, I'm just fixed in where I am. Amen, Apostle. I appreciate that insight. And so, again, I would just say as we look at this lesson today and as we think about your mindset, and I said it earlier, several things if you're making notes, the person who talks to you the most is you. And so you've got to always ask yourself, what are you saying to yourself? And I love how the Lord positions Joshua. He says, one, it's his I. He says I many times. So if you went into your Bible and you circled how many times God says I, Joshua, you got to rely on my strength. This isn't about you. But then he uses three times where he says, be strong and be courageous. And so now he's focused on Joshua's mindset. Joshua, do you have the right mindset? And then he goes into the next part in this same scripture. God, God's good success is based on obedience to God's commands. So I want us to just pay attention to this as well. Notice in this scripture God says three things to Joshua, and then I'm going to open it up for questions from the Sabbath school class. He says three things that I think are really, really important. He says, one, observe to do according to the law. So as you come into this nation, you've got to be really careful. Remember, Israel had a problem of falling into idolatry really quickly. They were not too far removed from Egypt 
and Moses going to get the commandments that they said, you know what? We don't know when he's coming back, but guess what? Make us a God. And they were actually, Aaron takes their earrings. And so what happens is he makes this golden image, this golden calf. And so he understood these people, will, they can fall away quickly. So three things he did. He said, observe to do according to the law. Don't turn from the right hand or the left and you will prosper. He says, don't let the book of the law depart out of your mouth. Meditate on it day and night you will prosper and have good success. So I want us to think about, this is what God's saying to Joshua. He's saying, observe to do according to the law. Turn out from the right or the left. And then he says on the book of the law, don't let it depart out of your mouth. He really says, meditate on it day and night. So I want to open it up to the class. This is where we want to begin to transition. I want you to share with me, what are some of the distractions that can get in our way from building a strong relationship with God. So think about even everything you're dealing with in your life. Let's throw it out. What are some of those distractions that can get in your way and throw you off course? So I'm gonna open it up to our audience so you can put it in the chat. You can come off mute and, and share it or our Facebook audience, throw it in and we will try and get it from our Facebook. So what are those things that can distract you? And being impressed of why they are doing that. I just want to add this. Find that one of the challenges was going to be when they were under Moses' leadership, after they left uh, Egypt, they were kind of protected. If you, if you think about it, they moved as one unit. Whatever land they went through, they even though they were messy, they were uh, disobedient, but they moved as one unit. Now, they're getting ready to dispersed into a land and they, when they dispersed into this land, they're going to find out that we are no longer operating as one unit because I now I have neighbors and my neighbors don't believe what I believe. My, my, my neighbors don't, um, they're not taught what I'm taught. So now I have to interact with these people and because I'm interacting with these people what, what can I do? And the thing that, that Joshua the Lord was telling Joshua tell them this Yes, your neighbors may not know me, but don't you depart from the book of the law. Your neighbors don't even have the commandments of God, but don't you depart from them. See, the focus was you're not moving there in a unit. You're dispersing. But as you disperse, even in, the, in our church organization, we got churches all over the country, all over the world. So we're not moving as one unit, but whatever, whatever city we're in, whatever state we're in, whatever country we're in, you don't depart from the law. I love that point, Apostle. So, um, so what I heard you say, and I think that's a good point, when they were, and I always think about when we raise our children, they're in our home, and then actually then they go off to school, they get into the world, so they've been taught, and they, they're in our protective cocoon, but then when they get out, they're dealing with the world themselves. And so here's some things I just wanted to pick up some people are putting in to our Facebook. So uh, our brother Victor says, the lust of the flesh. So if you get a moment, I just want to touch on that a little bit. If you, go, if you look at 1 John 2, 16, John writes, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it's of the world. So, Brother Victor, thank you for bringing that point out. Um, someone from Facebook says, overly observing others is a huge distraction, unnecessary comparisons. Um, if you've heard me teach before, one of my favorite quotes, and I thought about it this week, comparison is the thief of joy. So when I begin to compare myself to someone else, I'm either going to get an exalted view of me or I'm going to begin to look down upon myself. So comparison is the thief of joy. And then our sister Joy says there could be workplace situations that cause us to uh, be distracted. And it's very important because what this lesson is dealing with, if we're going to be strong, if we're going to be courageous, we have to have the discipline to make sure these things don't distract us from hearing the voice of God and being obedient to his word. I've got another point. All right. So someone mentions here, back, back to the learning notes with the fear and faith question. 
We can have both, meaning we must make a conscious decision to be brave, although at the onset of the challenge, we may feel fear. Basically, when a wife wakes her husband in the middle of the night and says an intruder is in the house, that man really doesn't feel like it's co like going downstairs, but decides to reject the fear and move in faith. So whoever put that out there, they're making sure husbands, we got to protect our wives. So Apostle Ragman, anything you want to say? Yes, that was a good one. I want to go back to Brother Victor's point. Because that was one of the things that, keep in mind now, I was saying a moment ago, that Israel moved as one unit. Right. Everybody moving. We all look alike. We all Israelites. We all this. Hey, you're going into a land now where there are some people that don't look like you. Mm. Right? And one of the warnings that God um, <laughs> gave to Israel was that don't you get involved with them. Don't. You don't marry their daughters. Mm -hmm. Your son does not marry their daughters. You don't. You don't allow that to happen. Now people want to use this for race relations. That race relations was not the issue here. Okay. They serve a different God. You know, I don't care if you marry a baboon. They better. They better serve the same God you serve. <laughs> All right. So, Apostle, let me ask this question as we look at this, especially as we deal with distraction. So, um, I've shared before: sin doesn't leap on you; it creeps okay. on you. I love the point that you make is now as they get ready to go into the promised land, they're exposed to um, people who don't serve the same God. And God warns them against this, this intermingling, because typically what happens is, um, and, and we say it, my, my great grandmother used to say it all the time, one bad apple can spoil the whole bunch. And so here's the thing I would ask you, as you think about this in our interactions with people who are not of who are not believers. How do we interact with the non-believers? But how do we continue to make sure we're not distracted as we want to obey God? Keep your head in the book. That's the same instruction <laughs> that God was given to Israel here. You got to interact with these people. You got to go to work with them. You got to live with them. But you got to make sure that you do not depart from the law. You know, look, go back to this country in its early inception when, um, now see, the history writers make it all about the um, Indians seeing these um, fair-complected, blonde-haired women <laughs> and wanting them. I would take it a step further. I'm sure that some of them fair-complected, blonde-haired women wanted them Indians also. <laughs> uh, so, but my whole point is that's not that was not the issue. The issue was if you were looking, if you were in Christ, if you had a knowledge and a belief system, why would you, no matter what they looked like, how handsome or how pretty somebody was, you cannot allow yourself to be distracted with those things if they don't serve the God you serve. So, Apostle, I, I love that point. And so, because again, this is really what the lesson is talking about. It's making sure we do not get distracted. Yes. So, if I'm trying to understand, so um, you're, you're saying if they don't serve the same God, I've got to be mindful. And I love the point. That's a nugget. If you're watching Sabbath school today, stay in the book. But you know what? I'm busy. Uh, I'm dealing with COVID. I've got all these things that I'm dealing with. The world has changed. Things are upside down. I, you know what? I, there are days I'm just so busy. I don't have the time. And sometimes I just want to watch TV. I don't want to listen to the kids. I'm distracted. How do we help people deal with those distractions, Apostle? The same thing that Jesus, that God did in um, Joshua chapter one. You talking about how many times he reiterated saying that you know, be strong and be, be very courageous. This lesson should help us during this time, this season of COVID. Look, saints, be strong. Mm -hmm. Be very courageous. You know, I'm one of those people that I'm very cautious when I go out, but I'm not stuck at home. There are some people that um, because of this um, pandemic, and I respect the fact that they don't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. Now, what's going to happen to your mind during this time? You did good for the first three months. The first six months. Now we almost we had a year, and we're within a month of being everything when things start shutting down. 
you almost at a one year mark. Where's your mind? You know, how are you going to stay with Christ? That's one of the challenges that uh, they said church is going to have when everybody gets down vaccine and all these things are done. People are back in a good place. There are people that are not going to come back to church. Right. Why? Because right. during this time, right. they did not stay strong. Right. They did not stay very courageous because they allowed the cares of the world. And you were saying a moment ago, um, they compressed it. They, they talk to themselves. That's the voice they hear. Mm -hmm. And the voice they heard start making excuses. The saints don't show no love. And the pastor don't show love. And this one's going on. And that's going on. And all these poor me, woe is me uh, stories start speaking in their mind. And they start living it. But you cannot live this thing. You got to guard your mind to say that I'm not going to pick up on the cares of the world. I'm not going to spend my time with the things of the world. I'm going to stay focused. I'm going to be strong. I'm going to be very courageous. Now I'm speaking to me, saying I'm going to be strong. I'm going to be very courageous. That's the instructions I got. And now I'm going to tell myself the same thing. Amen. Apostle, I love that. I was getting excited when you were saying that. So I think the more we repeat those things, and when we think about it, there came a time in David's life, he had to encourage himself. There was no one else around to encourage him, but he encouraged himself. So that's the exhortation I would give to the saints, is that we have to be strong and courageous in this time, in this season. Sister Darlene put something out there. A lot of times we make excuses and so let's just eliminate the excuses. Let's let's make sure these three things observe to do the law. Don't turn to the right nor to the left. The book of the law will not depart out of your mouth. You got to meditate on it day and night. If you're making notes, I'm a big believer in you got to win the day. So a lot of times people talk about, all right, I, I'm going to have a great year. Throw the year out. All I need you to do is win today. All I need you to do is focus on today. Because if I can win today and I can win tomorrow, guess what? I can put together a winning week. And if I can win a week, guess what? Then I can win a month. And if I can win a month, I can win a I'm getting myself excited. If I can win a quarter, I can win a year. But it all goes back to how do I win the day? When I get up, what's on my mind? When I hear bad news, how do I process it and say, you know what? I'm going to be strong. I'm going to be courageous. I'm going to stay in God's word. God's word is going to elevate me. It's going to lift me up. That's what this lesson is really all about. Someone on Facebook said, you got to stay focused. This is a prime moment where the enemy will try and distract the saints. And Apostle, you said it earlier. He will distract the saints by saying, look at what the church isn't doing. Look at what people aren't doing. It's so easy because here's the thing. Remember, when you get in that negative spiral, that negative spiral will pull you down. The enemy never comes after the strongest. He may come after the weakest. When you watch, and, and I know some of our audience watches the Discovery Channel. Notice they never, when, they, when, when packs are hunting, how they hunt, they want to isolate one so they can get that one by themselves. Let's not allow that to happen, amen. So I wanna just throw some other things out here. Our mother, Julia, mother, Julia, thanks for putting something out there on Facebook. Mother Julia Jackson says, let your faith be bigger than your fear. Take yes. that nugget today, Saint. Let your faith be bigger than your fear. All right, Sister Joyce says this. We know that we have to deal with different people in the world. But we need to make sure that we don't follow their ways. Our mind needs to focus on the prize, which is the kingdom of God. And that's per LeVon. So I appreciate you sharing that. Here's the other thing. If I'm required to survive by myself, why do I need to come back to church? That's a great question. Sister Charmaine asked that. I want to read it again. If I am required to survive by myself, why do I need to come back to church? Apostle. Excellent. Excellent question. This is the thing, though. You are not required to survive by yourself. Situation may mandate that you are not in the company of others. But the thing is, uh, back to the point that Deacon Preston made in chapter one, look how many times the Lord said, I, I, I. Sister Charmaine, for an example, might be home. God bless her with this new home. She might be there by herself. But guess what? She's not by herself, right? 
She, the Lord is with the Lord. I'm with you always, <laughs> even till the end of the world. Why? I'm not alone. And when this situation or this um, pandemic is over, I'm going to look forward to assembling myself in the house of God with the people of God. Why? Because that's what I'm required to do. Fail not to assemble yourself. So yes, uh, uh, Sister Charmaine, I thank you for making that because that's going to be the mindset of some people. Look, for the last year, I ain't seen nobody, but I made it okay. This is temporal. This situation is very temporal, not to see. Man, I appreciate that, Apostle. And again, I love that question from Sister Charmaine is, and I love the response that you had. And someone put in Hebrews 10, 25. And so I want us to think about this, and I appreciate so much our engagement. So I want us to think about some of these things as we look at, um, as we think about some of the things I want us to be mindful of. So we talked about some of the distractions that can cause us to lose focus on our relationship with God. I want us to be mindful. We're in a season where we can easily get distracted. <laughs> So this lesson is encouraging. Be strong. Be courageous. So go to Matthew chapter 7, 13 through 14. Thank you, Preston. Yeah, please. Go ahead. Okay, so we use the scripture, um, Hebrews 10 and 25, fail not to assemble. What does that really mean? Because for the past year, we haven't been able to do that. Okay. So failing to assemble does not look like uh, coming to coming to church traditionally on the seven-day Sabbath. Mm -hmm. What is that failing to assemble really look like? Because it's not what we, it's not the way I thought it to be. Because I've been out of church for almost a year. But you know, uh, Sister Charmaine, let me just kind of touch on that. You've been out, not from a desire, you've been out because of a mandate. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? You've been mandated to not be able to assemble and you know you want the people that occasionally have been able to do that but I, I, you, I know you're speaking for the, the masses that who have not been able but the thing is you want to make sure I'm sorry my got this door open. Um, you want to make sure that I don't allow this situation to cause me uh, to, to, to turn away from what God has commanded I'm and God going to take me and keep me through this, whether it's another six months, another year. But my desire is to be with those of the body of Christ. Be with, I mean, um, I don't want to be by myself for the rest of my life. I don't want to be stuck in a house. I don't want to be stuck in a uh, situation where I can't get out and intermingle with the people of like mind. Yeah, so Apostle, I love the point that you brought up, and I had not looked at it that way. I, you mentioned the desire, and so I think one of the things as I look at Hebrews 10 and 25, it's really looking at the intent of the heart of the person. So I never want to get to a point where I don't want to be in fellowship with the body of Christ, and so that gets to heart. And so we're not being able to congregate like we traditionally have not because it's a heart issue. It's just a leap. At some point, it's a legal issue. I think the other thing I think that's really important is I believe COVID has pushed the church to adapt. It has pushed the church to do things in different ways. Do I think technology like Zoom and Facebook and other things will now be a part of how we incorporate things into our worship service? Yes. Yes. Because I think these things have been good. Now it's how do we leverage it? Because even now, Hebrews 10 and 25, we're not in the sanctuary, but are we together? We are. We are. We're not failing. We are assembled right now. We're just not assembled down at the, the church we typically go to. But Sister Charmaine, I think you bring up such a good point that gets to intent and where my heart is. If someone's watching a broadcast today and you have in your mind, I don't want to be back in church because I don't want to be with those people. Watch your mind. That's because right. that's the battle of the mind. That's because if you right. plant the seed, I don't want to be with those people. I don't want to interact with the saints. I don't. That's a very dangerous place to be because that's where the enemy is trying to win your mind. Apostle, anything you want to share with that before we jump to Matthew? Dig because I think you cover that well because that's my biggest fear as a pastor of a congregation. Um, my fear is that 
And I'm, I'm concerned about our young people because mm -hmm. this pandemic is playing havoc with them and, and have, uh, how they process things. The question is, will they stay engaged? Mm -hmm. Can Do they have enough in them to hold on until we get back to what is traditional church? Um, some of the older saints been through some other trials and tribulations. Mm -hmm. And for you, this is about a light affliction. But for our young people that's, you know, getting from their teenage year mm -hmm. into being young adults, mm -hmm. um, they got a lot on their plate. Mm -hmm. They got a lot that coming to them. And who knows? And Satan would love for church to get push, pushed to the back burner. Mm -hmm. And we are praying for them. We are making sure that, you know, Lord, keep their mind. Mm -hmm. uh, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. That's my prayer for our young people. Because I, I take note of something. Bible study, we don't have as many of our young people on. Sabbath school, we don't have as many of our, of our young people on. Um, uh, afternoon worship, guess what? We don't have as many of our young people on that we see when they're in the sanctuary. So, and, I, and I'm not, young people that, that are on, if you share with others, we don't, this is not a statement of judgment. This is just saying, I am concerned. I'm thankful for those who do join in. But when I look at the number of young people we have and the number that uh, are taking advantage of the things we are doing, it, it brings about a great concern to me about when this is all over, what will the young people do? You know, when we have to try to win them back or will they stay engaged and winning them back would not be a process. Amen. Apostle, I appreciate that context. And so I want us to think about this as, and I'm just sharing this. Um, this is from Robert Frost. And I think it's so appropriate as we look at this lesson, two roads diverge in a wood. And I, I took the one less traveled by and that has made all the difference so go with me to matthew chapter 7 verses 13 and 14 and so as we think about this scripture so we we hear this scripture a lot so i want to give some historical context around matthew so if you think about it matthew is one of the 12 um, some of the disciples would have called him by his um, his hebrew name they would have called him levi he was a tax collector. One, he was very despised by Jews because he actually would have been working for the Roman government. Um, he probably but would have been extremely wealthy because he was a tax collector. And a lot of times people looked at tax collectors in a negative light. If you heard Apostle Clark say something from the time of the ending of the writing of the Old Testament into really this time of the New Testament or people hearing the voice of God, there was a gap of about 400 years. And this 400 year period was, ma was a major concern. And I loved how Apostle Clark put this out yesterday. So I never had been mindful of the fact or thankful for the Sadducees and the Pharisees and, the, and some of the zealots, but they actually kept a lot of the things intact that actually we see in the New Testament. So Matthew's recording of the gospel is, is written to a Jewish audience that says, guess what? This Jesus that has come is the Messiah. He is the promised Messiah for us as a people. So when you read Matthew, you will see a lot of Old Testament references because what the writer is trying to do for his Jewish audience is say, listen, don't look for another, don't look for another Messiah. This Jesus is the Jesus. He is the Messiah. When you look at Matthew's conversion, Jesus simply says, Matthew, follow me. And he actually walks away and begins to follow. And then we look in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. So let's read this together. And we're going to really work through trying to unpack this. So he says, now remember, this is actually the end of um, the Sermon on the Mount, which is really Jesus's longest sermon. And this is coming to the close of that. And he says, Enter ye into the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. So I want us just to think about what did you hear? What did you hear in this text? And I'm going to read it again. It says, enter. Enter means make a choice. Um, no one's pushing you into the gate. You've got to make a choice to enter 
the gate. Enter ye into the straight gate. So I've got a straight gate, and then it gives me another gate. Because he says, wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to what? He says, destruction. And he says, many there be which go in. I make a choice. I go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto what? Life. And few there be that find it. So I just want to think about some things as we walk through this. That broad gate, that that broad path leads to destruction. That narrow gate, it says it leads to life. So as apostle, as we think about this part, be strong, be courageous, and we look at this text. What do you see are the, the differences between the two ways? And as I'm making a choice, why would I make the choice to take the broad way? What's the because feeling of the Broadway? The Broadway is easy. The Broadway doesn't take a lot of effort. You don't have to worry about having any set of principles. You don't have to worry ab about having to uh, have knowledge of anything. You are led by your own mind. When you feel like, uh, remember, the, I, you might be a little young for this one, Deacon Preston, but uh, you know the, the, some of the slogans they've had, you know, if it's good to you, good for you. You know, uh, it's your thing. Do what you want to do. These were expressions that was was um, prominent when I was coming along. And people picked up on these things and they lived these things. And, and they felt justified in doing these things. Yet, the truth of the matter is, it was not good for them then. And it's not good for them. But it was easy. It is so easy. Uh, that broad path. Give this morning. It's the Sabbath. Do I need to recognize the Sabbath? No. I'm going on the Broadway. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to do it my way. You know, that's what the song of old. And he did it his way. I did it my way. These people sung the song. And these, these lyrics and things play on your mind. If the songwriter said, and the one that's well, Frank Sinatra singing, I did it my way. Well, all right, Frank. You and the Red Pack did it your way. But there are others that hear this and they start feeding something in your spirit. Do it your way. Mm -hmm. yeah. And your only, way is broad. Not only, not only that, that broad way is crowded. And people like to follow a crowd. Crowd draws mm -hmm. people. Wow. That's right. Man, I, I think that was St. Many. I, that was such a great nugget. People yes. love to follow the crowd. So remember this. I always go back to the book of Noah. How many people got saved? Eight. Eight people got saved, right? So you think about it. If, if, if God doesn't care about numbers, it's not a numbers thing. And so I love Sister Minnie's point is people like to follow the crowd. This way, this, this taking this straight gate in this narrow way, it's for the individual that says, you know what? It doesn't matter. And the apostle read it earlier. As for me and my house, we're going to make the choice to do what? Serve yes. God. When it's not popular, when people will say you're closed minded, when people will say Christianity or Jesus is irrelevant today, why would I need to follow him? I'm my own God. I'm my own person. I'm going to do it my way. Now, the slogan I would say is that's Burger King. Have it your way. But that's not how it's supposed to go in our walk with God. So the thing is, let's go back to Joshua where God is telling him, observe to do the law. Turn out to the right or to the left. Meditate on this day and night. Because when you do this, you're building relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm not doing it just to do it. I'm doing it to build a relationship with Jesus. So I love some of the conversation. I'm going to look here in our chat because some people put some things in here. Exhorting one another, not slogans. So I love Sister Darlene said, we got to exhort one another. We've got to encourage one another. Brother Victor put in here, and I like this point. And this is one of our, our uh, scriptures for one of our principles. Behold how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. What's popular is not often right. And what's right is often not popular. Man, that's another nugget. What's popular is not often right, and what's right is often not popular. So as we look at this, these two pathways, here's the question I would ask the class for self-reflection and application. What way are you on right now? Mm -hmm. What way 
are you on? What choice have you made? Are you on the straight and the narrow? Are you on the broad and the wide? What choice have you made? Because remember, it doesn't say someone puts you on a path. You actually either entered or you went into it. You made a conscious choice. Choice. That's I would ask you to think, what choice have you made today? Have you made a choice to be obedient to the word of God? Have you made a choice even though there are a ton of distractions? If you look at social media, if you look at your TV, if you think about your music choices, have you made a choice to be distracted and be on a broad way? Or have you made a choice to say, I'm going to obey the will and the word of God? and be on this straight and narrow way. Because the reality, one leads to destruction and one leads to life. Apostle, anything you wanna add before we jump to our last scripture? I know we are, we've got uh, a few more minutes left. Anything you wanna add, Apostle? No, go ahead with that. I, I, I enjoyed uh, the comments that uh, was in the chat and and just where I, I, my big thing is, I trust that this lesson will help some of us that may have not intentionally, but mind begin to slack and, right. and just telling us to stay strong, stay right. courageous. Don't don't look to the left or to the right. Stay focused on your course. You know, you were talking about a moment ago, the Burger King slogan, um, you know, I, we used to quote that a lot. Have it your way. You can have it your way. But guess what happened to the Burger King, Burger King on Pan Top? They closed. Amen. Have it your way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Go ahead. All right, Apostle, I never know what Apostle is going to say. But here's the thing I'll say to, you, to, to everybody is if you know anyone or if you've ever been on a ship or anywhere, if you go off course one degree and you're going a short distance, maybe it doesn't matter that much. But if you go off one degree and you're on a really long trip, what happens, you will end up in a significantly different place. And I want, you, I want us to be mindful of that today is that is, are there things in our life that are causing us to be distracted? And it seems like a little thing now, but it becomes a big thing next week or it becomes a big thing in a year. And so this lesson is really encouraging us to be strong and be very courageous. First John chapter five, and we're going to wrap up here. First John chapter five and in verse three. And I love this scripture. First uh, John chapter five, verse three. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. Or if you looked at the word grievous, they're not a burden. Um, I love this. This, this one has a, a personal application for me and then I'll give, I'll open it up to the Sabbath school. I remember one time early in my career when I just, fir I'd first come at really, coming to the Sabbath. And I was in this competition. Uh, I was very competitive when I was a younger man. And so the reality is I was working towards uh, this designation. And every time I, this, this young lady I was competing against, and I told my wife, I said, I'm a Sabbath keeper. So she has all this extra time to study. She's going to get in front of me because we just don't have the same amount of time. And the Sabbath is not, it's not fair to me. And it's such a burden. And I remember sitting in an office one day and what happened, the Lord spoke to me and gave me first John chapter five and three. And he told me, don't ever call my commandments a burden. Because the thing is, you may think because you're doing the commandments of God or you're being obedient to God's word that it's going to put you behind. But I'm living proof. From that day, I'll never forget, I was in the office on, on Pantops. I left the office. I came down to the church and started tearing for the Holy Ghost. And the reality is the Lord really dealt with me to say, listen, one, when you obey me, I'm going to always take care of you. That's right. So when we think about this commandment, mm -hmm. his commandments are not grievous. There's never a time in your life that when you make a conscious choice to obey God, he will not fail us. He will not forsake us. He will never leave us alone. So 1 John chapter 5 and 3 whole is, is very special to me because that's when God said, listen, when you obey me, I will take care of you. Apostle, anything you want to say as we wrap up and look at some, some comments in Facebook, I want to just read this and then I'll give it to you. Um, Brother Victor says this, if we do something habitually, it becomes the norm. So get back to win the day. When I win the day, am I reading my Bible? 
Am I meditating? Am I praying? Is that a part of what I need to be doing every day? Per our brother LeVon, at one time I was on the wide road until I got halfway down. It, I seen that it wasn't going nowhere, but the spirit of God touched me. So I back up to the entrance and I take the narrow road. Now I see how peaceful it is. Thank you for sharing that. So many of us were on that Broadway and thank God that he pulled us out and he put us on the straight path. Apostle Ragland, anything you want to share as we get ready to wrap up this Sabbath school lesson today? Thank you, our bigger person. As we wrap up, this is the thing I want us to understand. Back to the beginning of the lesson. The Lord told Joshua, my servant Moses is dead. Now it's going to fall in your lap. You got to get these people. They, you know, they have a history. They remember, many of them remember coming over the Red, coming across the Red Sea and the miraculous uh, defeat they had God delivered there. All right. They've been through a process and now they're at the Jordan. They got to cross over the Jordan, but on the other side of the Jordan, you know, I got something for you. They get there and God said, now, look, I need a renewed commitment from you. I'm going to get ready to disperse you. Um, we have 12 tribes here and the tribes are going to be divided, give them boundaries. This is your section. That's your section. Everything is laid out for you. But you said earlier, Joshua and Caleb said, we can take this. We can take this land. The spies said, no, there are giants over there and all this. But he's saying the same thing. Be, cur be, be very courageous, right? Just stay very strong. Be strong and very courageous. You're going to do this. Why are you facing? Uh, those people, the Israelites, didn't know what to face when they got to, to the land of Canaan, the land of promise. But he's saying, stay with me. And I'm saying to the saints today, while we're going through this pandemic, stay strong, stay, stay very courageous. And you do. God got just stay committed, though. Don't lose your commitment to God. He, now you're going to be facing battles, but every battle you face, you're going to be victorious. Everything that come up against you, you're going to be victorious and keep the mindset. As for me and my house through this. I'm going to serve the Lord you know, because I trust him. I heard his word. I'm going to stay strong and I'm going to stay very courageous. Amen. Apostle, I love those remarks. And I would say this. I thank Brother LaVon Le who put that comment. If, if you're on the Zoom or if you're on Facebook, man, when we were in a world of darkness and sin, we should be excited that God called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. So you're in your home. You should magnify God. It could have been us. They yes. could have been still on that broad way, but God had choice of us. And we. I'm excited about what God has done. And I want to encourage the saints as well. I want us to be encouraged today that you know what? God has not forsaken us. God has not forgotten about us. I want us to be mindful of the fact, if you can celebrate one thing today, celebrate when you went in, were in a world of sin, God kept you. God could have killed us when we were sinning and we were going contrary to his word, but he pulled us out of the world and now we are on this straight path. And finally, to our young people, I don't know about the saints, but again, I enjoyed the fast this week and I thank God for fasting and praying because God met us in our fast as we were hearing his voice, as we were praying and we were seeking his face. Um, we read Isaiah 58 a lot and, and we don't do it now, but I began to think about destroying the yokes, undoing heavy burdens, letting the oppressed go free. I thank God for fasting because I believe something's happening in our fast. I believe God is hearing our prayers. And I'm saying this, I'm praying specifically for our young people that God would guard their mind, that God would guard their hearts. Because right now in this day and in this season, I know it's a battle for them. So young people just know you've got people that are praying for you, that love you, that, that want you to have great success. So thank God for fasting. Thank God for prayer. And as always, thank you for being engaged with us in our Sabbath school class. So with that, Sister Charmaine, I'm going to turn it back over to you as we wrap up Sabbath school. God bless you. Amen. We do honor God and we thank him once again. He's blessed us in the Sabbath school. Amen. I thank the Lord for his blessings. God is really, uh, just like Apostle James and Dick and Preston said, I too want to echo um, 
staying in carriage, being in carriage, because God really is answering our prayers. Uh, in our leadership meeting this week, our superintendent, Dr. Matt Haas is his name, he made a statement that resonated with me. Uh, he said, what you focus on is what happens. And, and the reality of that is, it's scripture base. Uh, so a man thinking, so is he. Uh, so that that's that word is it, it has stuck with stuck with me, and there has been a situation. I sure wish I could break it down and tell you, so so you, you could understand what I mean when I say God answers our prayers. And you know that there there are things in our lives, there are things that God is doing for us. But you know how you can be praying about something for so long and look like it's not going to change. <laughs> It's not going to come together. I'm a witness. I'm a witness. I, in a conversation this week, this the Lord began to reveal <laughs> that how he's working on the mind, working on the mind, and it's coming together. And the way we used to process information is much better than it used to be. And I mean, it's the handwork of God. All I'm saying is that the Lord does answers prayers. And when you think that is no hope for the situation, God, only God know how to put it back together again. Only he does. So be encouraged. Hang on. Tie knot. My mama would say, tie knot. Hold on. Meaning continue to keep your faith in God. That's what back then when she would say it, I didn't get it. Um, Lady Anna Lee Bishop, when she would tell me, show me tie knot and hold on. I didn't get it then, but I understand. <laughs> I understand what you mean now. T hold on. Keep keep your faith in God. Keep your faith in God. Tie that knot and hold on and, and wait until the Lord brings the change. So, again, thank you for tuning in. Sabbath School, is there a question, comment that you want to, that we, you wanted us to address, but we didn't get to? I just want to allow space for you to do that before I turn and give it back to Apostle James. All right, then, if no um, no other question, comments, again, thank you for tuning in. Um, it's in your hands, Apostle James. Thank you, Sister Charmaine, I dig and Preston, for a great class on this morning. Again, I want to thank Sister Darlene and Lady Jane for taking the younger classes prior to this. Look, it's been a blessing, but my concern, my heart is a little heavy when I begin to consider our young people. Dig and Preston uh, alluded to it also earlier about the fact that whether you are house of God, whether you join us by Facebook Live or on Zoom, it's not about denominations. All of our young people, all of our young people are going through. There are young people committing suicide because they can't socialize the way they used to. Listen, if you have a young, if you have children, teenagers, whatever, if you have grandchildren, and you got the uh, that you recognize the struggle that they are having. We are fasting. We're going to continue to fast this week. I enjoyed um, reading the scriptures that you have sent to Sister Brenda for her to post um, uh, every day and just highlighting. Say, just let us continue to fast. Let us continue to go through. We fast for a 24 hour period. Uh, for 24 hours, no meat, no drink, just uh, go before the Lord. And, and uh, let's focus on the young people that Satan would not steal them, not take their mind during this time that we are in now. We simply ask that you will, uh, if you don't have any young people, you don't have any children, grandchildren, hey, there's too many young people out in this world that need your prayers as a church, as a congregation, as a body of baptized believers. We are trusting and believing God that Satan will not steal our young people during this time. Amen. And we're going to go before the Lord continuously this week. Lord, let us keep them. Let us not, not lose them because of their state of unrest. So again, we thank God for you. We ask that you will be blessed. Um, and at one o'clock, come back and join us from for the afternoon worship. There is a word from the Lord. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you shortly.